Last month, we had 3.57 million in cash collected, which was a company record. And we've done that super fast in about three years. But we've made a tremendous amount of mistakes along the way. And a lot of these mistakes have cost me millions of dollars, tons of pain, and tons of heartache. So in this video, I'm going to share with you one of the biggest mistakes I've made, which all comes down to how I was investing the money I was making along the way. The easiest way to explain this mistake in this story is to rewind back to 2018. So in 2018, I was a sales rep. I was making a little bit of money, but nowhere near the amount of money I make now. I hadn't really learned the lesson of focus yet. I was in an e-commerce mastermind where I was trying to start an e-commerce business on the side as like a side hustle. That mastermind was held by Trey Llewellyn. And Trey Llewellyn had a podcast called The Commerce Kings. And I listened to every single episode. He'd interview really successful, really, really cool people. And one of the episodes that was one of the best I've ever listened to was this buff dude with a mustache and his name was Alex Ramosi. And so this was way before Alex was who he is today and everybody knew about him back then. I mean, this is one of the first podcasts, you know, I had ever seen him on or I think he had ever done. And uh, he was really just known in kind of the click funnels world as sort of the gym marketing guy. But Jim Launch at the time was doing, I think, two and a half or three million a month. He was making a tremendous amount of money. And Trey would always ask the guests in the podcast how they invested their money. And so they would always give these super fancy responses. You know, I remember this one guy talking about land and then, you know, other people, commercial real estate, you know, all sorts of things, private equity. And what Alex said was one of the best responses I've ever heard. And it was something I had never heard before. And so when Trey asked him, what do you do with your money? He said, nothing. And in fact, all I focus on right now is stacking cash. And so when Trey probed a little bit deeper, Alex retorted and said, I'm not going to focus on investing any of my capital until the return on my capital exceeds the return on my time, which I thought was just such a profound way to think about it. And if you ever follow, thought a lot of Alex's content, all the stuff he shares, you can tell one of the things I really respect about him is that he's a really deep thinker and he really thinks these concepts through. And so what he was meaning is, you know, he might be able to get 15% on, let, let's say he had 15 million cash at the time. I don't know what he had, but he might be able to get 15% year over year of that on real estate. But even that 15% is nowhere near the amount of money that he would make just by continuing to focus on his business. So his strategy was just to stack cash until the return on his capital exceeded the return on his time. And so they were talking a little bit more about this. And one of the things Alex said that really drive the point home is he said, look, you know, when clients reach out to me, our clients from Gym Launch, and they say, Alex, I've made a ton of money. What should I do with the money? The first thing you should do is just get used to having it. Again, I thought that was so profound because a lot of times, and this is what I fell victim to, when you start making a lot of money, you really won't know this until you made a lot of money, but the money you make becomes a burden. It becomes this thing where you're like, what the hell should I do with this freaking money? And what makes it worse, one of my friends, Ravi Abulaba, we talk about this a lot, is there what's called inflation shaming going around. So especially in, you know, when I started making money in 2020, 2021, inflation was at all time high, it was right after COVID. And everybody just makes you feel like the biggest, dumbest idiot if you don't invest any of your money whatsoever and you stay in cash. And so what happens is, you know, I know for me, instead of taking Alex's advice and listening to it, like many great pieces of advice I've gotten over the years, I completely ignored it because for some reason I thought I was I was special and you know because I was successful I'd be able to make this work and I'd be this really great real estate investor, et cetera. So you know I proceeded to acquire tons of real estate and in doing so lost a tremendous amount of money and most importantly, just had a ton of pain and ton of heartache and really just wasted a lot of my time, which I should have spent just focusing on my business. So I wanna share with you two of the biggest, uh, stupidest investments that I've made and what I've learned from doing that. So the first one was single family real estate. When I got in, you know, I had a previous mentor and he was really into single family real estate. I got into single family real estate and I started acquiring properties extremely quickly. Like I remember there was one time I closed on five properties in a single day. And so we work with wholesalers, we get these pro formas, all these properties would show like 15 or 20% cash on cash, like crazy cash on cash returns. And what I didn't realize at the time was these are all C-class properties. Okay, which means like one step above the hood. And I'm sure there's a proper way to invest in C-Class, but what was happening is we'd acquire all these properties and they were just complete headaches and complete money pits. So for instance, for one, the property managers of those types of properties, they're all terrible. Like we had a property manager, they forgot to collect rent, which is insane because that's our job they get paid. The tenants were also terrible. So we bought all these properties and you know we inherited all these horrible tenants. There's tenants not paying, there's tenants you know paying just a little bit, there was a tenant that stopped paying. We had to pay them to leave because eviction would have cost more than just paying them to leave. And then when we paid them to leave, these squatters came in 
and they completely destroy the property. Squatters are like homeless people who just stay in the property. You know, we had some horror stories, but even the ones that were just normal properties, what would happen is, you know, you're cash flowing like 200 bucks a month on these properties, which what you freaking do? Like at the money I was making, why am I spending any of my time on something that's making me 200 bucks a month? But anyways, you're making 200 bucks a month, oh my God, and you're getting a hundred dollars a month debt pay down or whatever the hell it is. That all sounds good and dandy, except for it's not passive. And if you have one expense that's like 2000 to $5,000, which believe me, happens even if you do inspections and even if you do really thorough inspections happens a lot unless you're probably a seasoned real estate investor if one of those it wipes out two years of your cash flow so what i realized at a certain time is these were just not profitable and they were just massive money pits we didn't know what we were doing i was paying full-time staff members because i had so many that i had to manage these and basically we just had to get rid of them which again i'm in the process of doing now but also is a huge pain in the ass because you can't it's not like stuffed where you just sell this you can't just unwind it just like that you know it's a whole process and even in selling it with all the fees and all this stuff you know we're going to lose a tremendous amount of money but it is what it is you know it's a big mistake if i had to do it all over again i would have one either followed alex's advice or two what i would have done is found a great operator like ken mcelroy who's here in scottsdale um he's the main person who invests robert kiyosaki's money who has 30 years of experience and i would have just given him the money that way i could have gotten my allocation of real estate while being entirely passive and leveraging the expertise of somebody who's done it for 30 years because one of the things that i've also learned is you should really not invest in anything that you don't have an extreme advantage in something that's not entirely within your circle of competence so another example of this was crypto so again 2020 2021 crypto's taken off, right? At the same time, I'm getting inflation shamed. Everybody's saying, oh, if you're in cash, you're, you're the biggest, stupidest person ever. So I'm like, okay, of course I just FOMO in. You know, I'm investing in, of course, Bitcoin and Ethereum, which, you know, is fine, but even worse, you know, I'm playing around with altcoins and micro caps. And, you know, I've, I'm seeing my friends, some friends who had low seven, uh, not even seven figure net worth, all of a sudden be worth 30 to $50 million, you know? So like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm missing out. You know, what am I doing? And most stupid of all, I started investing in yield farming. Nothing wrong with that, but you know, I had capital in like nine different places. It certainly wasn't passive. I'm collecting my like couple hundred bucks passive each day or each week or whatever. That was all fine and dandy until Anchor went down. I lost a quarter million dollars in a day. Right after that, I was like, okay, I have capital in 900 different places, all these different exchanges, all these different wallets, all these different freaking DEXs and plat, you know, all this stuff. I just gotta take it all out of there. I gave it to Jeff Seckinger and this other guy named David Gahn, who are two different fund managers who could just completely do my crypto now. And even in doing that, you know, one of the funds I'm in, we actually, it's a venture capital fund for uh, crypto, we actually already 100 x on one of the investments in there. So it just goes to show you like how much better it is just leveraging experts and getting in and leveraging the experience of people who've been doing that. And then just keeping your experience and your your expert or your time and attention on stuff where you have a clear advantage. So I've done some other stupid stuff. Like I've invested in private equity and in, in companies without any sort of like thought process whatsoever around what is the even valuation of the company. I've invested in companies to where it sounds really, really good, but based on the current valuation I've invested in, it's obviously a horrible investment. You know, I just didn't even look at the terms. So I've done stupid stuff like that. I've, I've also invested in other stupid stuff, but generally, I mean, those are the two biggest things. And if you wanna know what I'm doing now, now I'm keeping the majority in cash or t treasury bills or something called fiduciary contracts, which is something I have, I have money in a Swiss bank. So it's something that they do to invest their money, which is really, really safe. It's like similar to treasury bills is like 3%. So keeping it very liquid, doing that, keeping it all under my trust so it's in asset protection, doing a little bit of boring index funds like the S&P 500 and the International Index, stuff like that. That's the majority of my investing is all super conservative stuff. And then when I do want allocations to alternative investments, I'm doing funds I'm, or I'm doing like really uh, like Ken McElroy's fund, for instance, uh, Jeff Seckinger's fund for crypto. So I can get my allocations to those different asset classes through people who have amazing experience where I'm more than happy to pay them two and 20 so I don't have to deal with it whatsoever. And then most importantly, what I'm gonna do moving forward is any bigger risks that I take that are not so conservative are gonna be directly within my circle of competence. So I'm not gonna do this, let's say even this year, but eventually I'll probably invest and buy a business where we can use our skill set to increase the valuation of the business over a two year time frame, and then be able to exit for a bigger multiple. I think that is a great way to leverage your capital, but I'm not going to do it the way I was doing it whatsoever. So hope you guys found this helpful. I mean, the biggest thing is that, you know, these pieces of advice were out there, right? 
Invest in your circle of competence. Stay focused. Hormozzi's advice about just stacking cash, getting used to having it. And you know, I just didn't follow that whatsoever because I thought I was different. I thought I was special, whatever. So hopefully if you're watching this and you're hearing this, you cannot make the same mistakes I did. And um, you know, I'll even say still to this day, making those mistakes, I view them as going to really expensive seminars to where it's like, okay, I had to invest a lot of money to make these dumb mistakes. And I did extract the lessons from those so I can not make those mistakes in the future when the stakes are higher. So hopefully you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next video.